Tell me about, right. um, you know, walking through those doors and being oh. uh, back at the Troubadour. Well, the Troubadour is like, a, you know, it's an old familiar haunt for me, but it's changed a lot through the years. You know, when I went, like, there was no bar there when I first started playing there. And when it, when then when they did put in the bar, it became a big, it suddenly blew up and became like a, a place where people would, you know, imagine that yes. people enjoy a bar. <laughs> it, well, it was probably a good idea. It might have been controversial among musicians at the time because there's a listening room. But what would happen is people would just be in the bar and if someone good started singing on stage. The word someone would like say, hey, check this out. And there are 12 people who walk in and stand there in the doorway while somebody. But anyway, I'm talking about the, you know, the open mic nights, you know, yeah. so I hung around for those. I don't think, as a matter of fact, when they opened that bar, I couldn't even drink. It wasn't legal. And one of the waitresses there made it her, her mission in life to make sure I didn't get anything to drink, you know, illegally. I mean, they just, they could have gotten shut down, I suppose. Uh, that's why they were concerned, but I didn't drink that much in those days and, um, or, or ever really. The thing about the Troubadour is that it's been, it was already an iconic place. I mean, when when I first started going there, it was the club in LA where you'd see the the really big uh, commercial acts like uh, some others brothers, somebody like that. But also, it became a showcase. So the first time I saw Elton John, it was at the Troubadour. The first time I saw Joni Mitchell, it was at the Troubadour. The first time I saw Delaney and Bronnie and Bonnie and Friends, it was at the Troubadour. And there was room for a band on stage, but they rarely had a full band on stage. And then because that was such a showcase and because th there was sort of rebellion among the rock and roll management, you know, and they opened the Roxy so they'd have their, a club that they didn't have to, they weren't going to be held prisoner by Doug West. And and because he would, he would sign some of these acts, but he would let them play there, but then he'd have options for them to play again in the future. And they, they were trying to get out of doing that. So that opened, so another club opened uh, that was owned by, you know, Lou Adler and David Geffen and others, so, you know, so that club never became the club that the Troubadour was or and continued to be. And what happened, though, is the Troubadour became a, like a, a, a destination for bands all over Southern California sure. who wanted to play at the iconic Troubadour. And they, they got this sort of pay to play situation where they would I don't know that they would have to pay, but they would they would they wouldn't they weren't getting paid because that was probably the case and um, certainly the case. In my case, when I play the open mic nights, eventually I got hired there, and I did. I, I my first gig at the Troubadour was opening for Linda Ronstadt. When not I played, too shabby. Yeah, not bad at all, right? No. So, and then the next time I played there, I was headlining, and I had Bonnie Raitt opening for me. And she said, "No, she wanted. She didn't want to play the Troubadour. We were friends. I and I, I talked to her into doing. I said, you got to play the Troubadour. I mean, that's where, you know.' And she said, "Well, I'd rather play at the Ashgrove, and the Ashgrove was the traditional club where all the are." blues heroes and idols and also bluegrass you know it was the traditional music place and the place that by and that you know Ry Cooter hung around and David Lindley and people and and Taj Mahal but I talked her into doing it because it was important it was important to be seen at the Troubadour 